these are a couple of questions I wrote while well, you were reading the other week. I thought I'd start there. And, and for example, what I'm noticing is it seems that there's a localization since such rich hour of, of the reader that, that happens on the page that I've noted seems to happen in some of the other works as well. You sort of locate the reader, as in such rich hour, of course, it's, it, you locate them by here's the date and the, you know, it's, okay. it's faith and time, uh -huh. you know, so they're localized, located in that way. It, it seems also in other works I've heard that people get located by, or the reader or the listener gets located by, if not date, um, some sort of precise moment yeah. that relates to the research of the, where the poem emerged from. And I wondered, yeah, I think that's that a really, I think that's a really good observation. That um, I'm definitely trying to give the reader one firm place, because the rest is going to be moving. Okay. And I think if all the terms are moving, there's no point of relativity. There's no way actually to make these moving objects relate to each other if there's not one fixed point. Okay. And I think there's something about um, the way we work in the world is always a matter of finding a fixed point against which other things are relative. Time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a fun one because that's the one thing we never can fix in actuality. And so the idea of trying to fix it in writing and proceed from there, I think, is fun. But in the visual work, I mean, in the, 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 the when you, oh, no, I was going to say, in the, the visual of any of these, when you look at work on the page, then the actual shape on the page, I think, can also be an anchoring. Okay. Because it takes on a physical reality there, it takes on a physical, that's got a physical object. So it holds the reader yeah. also. Yeah. What would happen for you if, if those markers, the original markers that, that feel, for me at least, very grounding, were eliminated? I think of developments that have happened in Susan Howe's work where she used to proceed by the sort of faux essay that would be very grounding. We know yeah. where the work was coming out of, and then it kind of start to splinter apart into I think, I think that's precisely why the splintering apart can work, though, mm -hmm. is because we've been grounded and, and then there's almost a delight in the dissolve, mm -hmm. to feel that ground dissolving. But I think it's very different from if we opened the book and there was just the dissolve. I think we'd always feel like we were trying to, you know, sort of get a purchase on a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. And instead, we get this firm background. And her faux essays, as you said, it's, it's a perfect way to put it, it's a perfect thing she does. Mm -hmm. and, and then, we've got a lot of room, we'll let her just Take go. Her exactly. Same because thing. we have a sturdy theater seat. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I mean, a lot of people are going to come to your work who have never heard of Lone Malt, right. who have never heard of, you know, um, yeah. the, the, the calendar of hours, although those may be more familiar image ones, you yeah. know, cover helps, you know, they yeah. go, oh, I've seen that work. Yeah. But um, do you feel that 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 those things help bring the reader into places that you've been spending a lot of time. Well. Yeah, with the little essay that's in the beginning there, and then the Lenotra hours mm -hmm. has also has like a page of just saying this is who he was, this is why he's important, mm -hmm. and this is the irony of his name because no one's going to know that mm -hmm. otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it's saying the poems are written with this background. Mm -hmm. And so you need that background too. Okay. And there seems to be you know, sort of a tradition that poetry always has to operate on its own. And you think, why? Why shouldn't it have footnotes or an introduction or any kind of framing device that's going to put it into perspective? And the um, Glass Age talks so much about framing. And I think whether, you know, it talks so much about framing because I was thinking a lot about it or I've been thinking a lot about it simply because it talks a lot about it, just that how essential that framing is. Mm -hmm. And so, to say, here's the frame, mm -hmm. you know. In addition, that was already present in Ghost with, with the windows. Right. And, and right. What, is, what surrounds versus what you see through. Yeah. yeah. Which, you know, seems to be something. You, you've worked both as, I mean, you have a PhD, and you write poetry, and you teach, and all of those things. Um, do you feel that your academic background that, you know, I know we've talked and you're doing less academic writing and, and putting more of your time just into the creative writing and to translation, do you think that that, you know, sort of putting aside of the academic focus as in that kind of writing is then coming into 
the poetry through these kinds that's of That's an interesting, that's an interesting question. I've never thought about it that way. But it's true that when I stopped doing so much academic writing, a lot more kind of historical mm -hmm. work, and all the work I did for my PhD was theoretical, mm -hmm. with a little bit of, I mean, it was theorizing on historical development, but it was really very much theoretical. And I think I missed, I think I was always really interested in just history. Mm -hmm. And so this gives me a chance just to go through the history. But also, you know, I know there's something about analytic writing, the theoretical writing, that I just don't, it's not the way I think. And I would, I kept watching interesting ideas Mm -hmm. just get flattened out in my prose and think, this is boring. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, I have one thing to say, mm -hmm. and I've already said it. And it's <laughs> like, I think I'm repeating myself. So I think it must have something to do with what, the way one's mind naturally works. And mine just does not work in syllogistic development mm -hmm. or accumulative development. Mm -hmm. And so, as a kindness to the world. <laughs> But yet, I mean, the new book that you're working on, does it have a title yet? Yes, it's Gravesend. Gravesend. And that's on ghosts. It's on ghosts. And it's, it's named after the city in, it, uh, in England, which is right at the mouth of the Thames, where the Thames meets the Channel. Mm -hmm. And it was the city from which many, many people throughout the 18th and 19th century left England for good and went either to Australia or to South America or to North America to start a new life. So and it's completely coincidental that it's called Great Sound, but it's it really is this liminal zone between one life and another, and the idea that the grave has an end mm -hmm. implies that there's something beyond the mm -hmm. grave, and so that the grave itself is this liminal zone. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'd, I'd love to find out more about it. I'm going to go and visit Great Sound <laughs> for a few days. And how did that become the title? And how did this book itself start? Like where did it start? It's not in a previous. No, but when I was finishing, when I was finishing hours, I was thinking, oh, I don't have another project. What am I going to do? And I know I can't invent projects. Mm -hmm. I can't say, hmm, what would be fun to write about now? It just doesn't work. And then all of a sudden, one day, it's like clearly, this is about ghosts. And part of it was, um, I had been at a conference that was focused on political writing, mm -hmm. and. I, my intervention had been this thing on, which I think is really interesting, about the way in which contemporary poetry is talking a lot more about things. And having been kind of, having sort of developed my writing in the shadow of the language poets, very much in terms of time, the late 70s and 80s, and the place in San Francisco, where and the language writing was so interested in what happens if you don't say anything, but let language say itself? What's mm -hmm. going to happen? And so kind of growing up in this atmosphere that was allergic to subject. Mm -hmm. And and then finally, I, I never really, well, I, I came to a, what I think was a pretty nuanced understanding of that. I never actually practiced it myself. I